Hello and welcome to the Supernatural Fandom Track here at Continual. I'm your host, Gail Z. Martin, and today we're talking with three of the tie-in writers who have written Supernatural tie-in novels and other related books. So this is uh, the official non-canon canon that uh, takes the Winchesters on some additional adventures. Before we get into all those questions, I'd love to have my panelists introduce themselves, starting with you, Tim. I'm Tim Wagner. I've published around 50 novels, about half tie-ins, half original, usually write horror and dark fantasy. I also teach uh, composition and creative writing at Sinclair Clare College in Dayton, Ohio. Okay. And John? I, I think I've got 14 novels, a little over half for tie-ins. Uh, my first time was a Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, followed by a couple angels, and then a long break until I started doing the supernatural novels and then a grim novel. And I've done a half dozen of my own novels, which are all basically supernatural suspense or paranormal suspense. Okay. And Keith. I'm Keith Ari DeCandido. I've written uh, three supernatural novels as well as a crap ton of other tie ins in about 30 different licensed universes, um, as well as uh, a whole bunch of my own original stuff, which ranges from urban fantasy to. Uh, high fantasy to science fiction to any number of other things. Um, and I also write about pop culture for tour.com and um, I'm a martial artist and I probably any number of other things that I can't remember due to the considerable lack of sleep. <laughs> I think we can all identify with that. So um, just a little background for folks who aren't real familiar with what it means to be a tie-in writer. You've all written for multiple universes and franchises. Um, how did it come about for you to be writing for Supernatural? Tim? Um, I sent Keith an email and asked who his editor was. <laughs> That's right, I'd forgotten that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to, I love Supernatural, just wanted to go ahead and, you know, throw my hat in the ring and they didn't have anything, you know, open at the time, but, you know, they said they'd remember me and somebody had to pull out of, um, of a novel. I don't know who it was, but they needed somebody to step in. And so I got lucky. Okay. John? Well, like I said, there was a big gap between my two angel novels and Supernatural and Titan Books actually found me. I think they saw what I had done and the kind of books I wrote and they thought I'd be a good fit. So way back in, I think it was 2011, maybe 2010, I did uh, Night Terror, which was my first of four Supernatural novels. So it was, it was a case where my, my website helped get me the job. You know, it had been sitting up there for a while. <laughs> to showcase what I did and so that worked out and then that led to me doing a Halloween novelization for Titan also so that's a good okay. question it's just a the basis of doing something in the similar field and looking like you're a good fit for something so okay Keith so the first three books were actually published by Harper Collins and then Titan took over the license with the fourth book which was my part of the dragon but um it actually wasn't put together by Harper. It, and in fact, the first few Titan books weren't put together by Harper either. They were put together by DC Comics uh, licensed publishing division. A um, little bit of publishing neepery here. Um, there was a period in the 2000s when Warner Brothers was having real difficulty getting tie-in novels done. Um, they, they had actually, there was a show called Without a Trace where they had actually written three tie-in novels that never got published because the deal never went through. Um, Warner Brothers was asking for some really onerous terms that the publishers were not willing to agree to. And it got to the point where no publisher wanted to work with Warner Brothers anymore because of what happened with, not just Without a Trace, but with several other different um, uh, TV show tie-ins. So when, when Supernatural came around, they decided to funnel it through DC's licensed publishing division, which actually had a very good reputation. They published things like... Um, the Death of Superman novelization that Roger Stern wrote, the Nightfall adaptation that, that uh, Danny O'Neill wrote, the No Man's Land one that Greg Rucker wrote. And, um, and, and because of that, uh, the Supernatural books were done through that office. And then they packaged the books for HarperCollins. The editor at DC uh, who first took on the, the Supernatural license was John Morgan, 
who I used to work with when he worked at Berkeley Publishing and I was working for Byron Price and he knew I was a fan of the show. So when he was looking for people to pitch, I was one of the ones he contacted as was Jeff Marriott. And uh, the two of us wrote the first two novels. Um, I wrote Nevermore, he wrote Witches Canyon. And then uh, Nevermore, to my glee, uh, sold much better than everybody expected it to. And John called me up and said, uh, Harper, we want to do a third book. Um, can you write one really fast? And I had another proposal that I sent to them in the first place. So I just said, why don't we do Bone Key? And they said, yes. So I did. That. Um, and then the license switched over to Titan. DC continued to do it at least for one or two books, but then they uh, ended the license publishing department as part of their eventual shift out to the West Coast. And Titan wound up just doing it themselves from that point forward. Okay. Now, um, I know Keith has fielded this question before, but we never know who's watching these and has uh, what they've seen before. So forgive, forgive a, a familiar question if you've heard it before, but uh, for those who aren't familiar with the process of writing a tie-in novel, supernatural or otherwise, um, how, how does it work? We've talked about how you got picked to do Supernatural or how you, you were able to toss your hat in the ring, but um, what about the creative process of coming up with the plot of the book itself? Uh, Keith? Uh, basically, and this, this is the way it works for almost every tie-in novel, is you have to come up with the plot outline first, and then that has to be approved by some, some representative of the company that owns the property. In this case, it's Warner Brothers um, for Supernatural. So somebody usually in the licensing department, occasionally it will be somebody directly involved with the production of the show, but more often than not, they're too busy actually producing the show to, to be involved in the, in the approvals process, although there are exceptions. Um, and, uh, and then once that's approved, you write the novel, um, but you don't even start writing until that plot is approved. And then, uh, and then that gets approved also. And, Sometimes there are rounds of revisions and sometimes there aren't. Uh, speaking only for my own three novels, the process was fairly painless with Warner Brothers. They were, they were pretty, the notes were pretty minor for my stuff. Okay, John? Uh, for mine, I've, I've had to do uh, pitches first. Usually they ask for a few, like three line pitches. And then they'll either approve one of those pitches or a couple of them and let me decide which are the ones I wanna do. And then uh, like the outline follows that and then you get notes back on the outline. And then once the outline's approved, then you get to writing the novel. When I first did Buffy, I had to do a sample chapter to show I could capture the voices of the characters. And then I didn't have to do that for Angel because they kind of I guess, trusted me by that point. And I didn't need to do that for the Supernatural books, just the pitches, three line pitches, and then the outlines. And then it gets approved each step of the way, as Keith said the license holder approves it or gives you notes and then you revise it and then they approve the revision and then you go ahead and write it at a breakneck pace. Because <laughs> you only have a lot of time to do it. Tim? And sometimes they give you a whole month. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the basic process was the same for me. Uh, one of the things I do is that and nobody has ever you know, told me to do this, no editor, is just to make sure that what I'm writing is something that I'm pretty sure that they're not going to reject outright. Like I'm not going to do, you know, supernatural meets Star Trek or something weird, you know, that, that you can do in fan fiction if you want to do, mm -hmm. but you just know that there are certain things you can't do to, to, that will stretch the show's premise too far or break the show or see too, or seem too much like fan fiction where you bring back all these beloved characters into one book that uh, just realistically, you probably wouldn't have in one book. Um, the only other thing that I had happen is that, uh, I think it was maybe for my second one that I did for Titan, but they sent me all the scripts for the whole season. This oh, one wow. time I've ever had that happen. And I was like, well, this is nice. I didn't read them because I didn't want to spoil anything, but it was nice to have them. But, you know, they, nice they, they, they did tell me at one point, they said, don't put Bobby Singer in your book because we've got plans for him. And he was already dead at that point, but he hadn't come back yet. And so I'm like, oh, well, that tells me in general what's going to happen. But Overall, you know, my experience with it was with them was very, very pleasant. Um, same as, as Keith was saying, um, they they really do care. And the fact that the the licensing people at um, you know Warner Brothers, I'd worked with them through Titan. I got to do two other books through Inside Editions because they were. So they said, "Oh, get Tim. Tim's great." 
you know, Tim will do this. And one of those books was the same deal. It was two writers that had to drop out of a project and they came to me. So I got lucky twice for supernatural books. Nice. You are you are proving all the advice we tell aspiring writers about network with other writers and always make sure you maintain a good relationship with your editors. Indeed. Um, they, they, they sent me the scripts too when, when I was working on it, although they ran out of them for at one point because uh, while I was working on Bone Key, there was a writer's strike. <laughs> and, um, which actually resulted in a bit of fortuitous um, thing. Usually, like I said before, the, the people involved in the production of the show don't have time to approve full manuscripts of novels because they're too busy producing a TV show. Um, but when I turned in Bone Key, Eric Kripke was on strike and literally had nothing better to do. So he, um, from what I was told anyway, uh, he actually read Bone Key and from, for at least the next couple of books, it was somebody in his office who was approving it rather than some random person in licensing. I don't know how long that held true, and I certainly don't know if it held true after Kripke stopped being the showrunner, but um, but that was kind of cool. <laughs> um, and and it was and it's fun sometimes to read the scripts ahead of time because I wanted to know because my I wanted my book to be as current as possible, um, and uh, so I, I I I kept up with the scripts anyhow because and also I don't care about spoilers, <laughs> but, um, and and that was that was very useful and not not every. Not every licensor is that accommodating and that friendly and that helpful. And it was really good that they were willing to do that and just keep us in the loop as to what was going on. When I wrote my second Supernatural book, they told me Bobby was going to be dying and I could choose to have Bobby in it or not Bobby. So I chose to have him in it. <laughs> of course. I think, How can you not have Bobby in that's it? That's right. I know. That's it's right. like, of course I'm going to have it. And then you have that, that uh, melancholy, you know, knowing that he's going to be gone. Mm -hmm. Now it's time he's going to be back. But I think that's also when I stopped getting scripts. I got scripts for the first two, and I don't think I got them for the last two I did. Oh, wow. At some point, they said, no more scripts. I, I had a reader find out that, you know, of course, as authors, we know which characters are going to die long ahead of time, you know, from the beginning. And they said, how can you live with that knowledge when you're writing this character and giving them a good day, knowing that down the road, they're going to be dead? I said, well, it kind of goes with the deal. With, with that's kind of the fun. With Supernatural, we were pretty close to the current, what was happening then, because I think Bobby was going to die within two weeks, so I didn't have to oh, wow. hold this wow. on a long time. I was getting scripts that were, you know, just airing like a few weeks later. So I knew it was coming. Maybe I knew by episode seven that he was dying in episode 10 or something like that, but it wasn't that far apart. Of course, when the book comes out, it's a whole year later, but by that point, everybody knows it's not a big secret anymore. Right. Buffy and Angel, I had to set it during certain periods where the editor said, okay, the next few books are going to occur during this time frame. And it was locked in. And then they would move that time frame to a different, a different area. With Supernatural, they've always encouraged me, at least, to stay as current with the what was going on in the show as I could. So it was usually within weeks of what was airing. But then the book comes out a year later and it feels old. But when I was doing it, it was fairly current. Now, John mentioned, you know, wanting to, the, the powers that be wanting to make sure you've got the voice for the characters. You, you have all written in so many different universes. What's your process for locking in on that voice for the characters, the tone for the show, um, from, one, from one property to the next, and particularly on Supernatural? John? Well, for me, it helps having the scripts. What I would do is take the PDFs of the scripts, scripts, and I would make a file that was Dean. It was all Dean's dialogue. And then I'd make one for Sam, and then for Bobby or Castiel or whoever. And before I would write lines for that character, I would just immerse myself in everything they had said recently. Because it changes over time, we've seen them be in different states. So you also have to be in the same emotional place they're in during the story continuity. So that helped me a lot having the scripts, because instead of having to watch episode after episode, I mean, I, I watched them all the time as they aired, but rather than going back and just fast forwarding and finding different spots, I could just refer to those text files I had. So that was really helpful having those. Okay. You really hear the person in your head. Mm -hmm. That's a great. That's a great technique. I'm going to steal that if I ever get scripts again. <laughs> yeah, they stopped giving scripts, so it's harder. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Well, maybe someday some other property might, but. Yeah, you know, I would just uh, I would immerse myself by watching them, and I would leave the closed captioning on so I could read the dialogue too. I do that whenever I watch movies or TV shows, anyway. Partially because my wife's hard of hearing, but mostly because I want to see it's you know written out as well. Um, 
and it's just kind of, uh, it's just, I don't know, it's something that I do. Evidently, I do okay at it. Editors have mentioned it. It's just, I, I, I just think supernatural. It sounds like the Music Man, where they do the think method of music. So, but I, I think absorb, uh, but really like sort of filling yourself up with supernatural is the best thing to do for, for me, it was anyway, to write these books. And once I started doing it, they, you know, I wrote my version of Sam and Dean, so I could return to them for like the third or fourth book or the fifth book. Okay, Keith? My answer is remarkably similar to Tim's. I, uh, I basically, even, even if it's, I mean, like John and like, I assume Tim also, I was watching the show anyway, but um, but you when you're watching it to write for it, you're looking for different things. So you're paying attention to different things than you pay attention to when you're just watching it for fun. Um, you know, when I when I've done stuff in properties, even ones I'm already incredibly familiar with, like Star Trek or like Leverage or like Farscape, I still sit down and marathon through it again um, just to get all the voices in my head and, and also to get like the tone and the feel of how everything is supposed to be. Um, I also watch with the captioning on, not because anybody's hard of hearing, but just because sometimes we miss stuff. Um, and uh, plus I like to point out spelling errors in the captioning, that always amuses me. But, um, uh, but it, there's, there's, for me at least, the best uh, research for getting the voices right is to listen to them talk. Um, Cause that, that, that conveys not just the words that they choose, which John's method is very good for, and I too may steal that, um, but also the tone. Um, and, and the nuances of, of, of the speech patterns and such, especially in tie-in fiction, that's really important because if, if your Dean doesn't sound, doesn't sound like what Jen, how, Jensen, how Jensen Ackles would talk, the, the readers are going to reject it. Um, you know, it has to, they have to be able to convince themselves that Jensen Ackles is saying that, that line, that, that Jared Padalecki is saying that line, that Misha Collins is saying that line, and, and, and Jim Beaver is saying that line, and so on. So um, that's, that's a critical part of it. Okay. Now you've talked uh, a bit about making sure that your story is going to mesh when it finally comes out uh, with, with the scripts and, and the input, but are there any other, you're basically writing extra episodes in between the episodes to an extent, um, expanding that, that canon universe. Any other tricks for making the story fit into the the slot where it's supposed to go when it it um, you're, you're kind of running a sub thing here. It's not part of the show, but it's part of the canon uh, in a way. So, what's your how do you make it fit? I guess is the short version of that, Tim. Well, I always picked a, you know a real specific time between episodes, and so I'd make sure that they were wherever the, my book would start, it would start near the place that they had left off in the last one. Maybe a, one or two lines reference. I want to know what kind of emotional state they're in too at the end of that episode so I can figure out how, what they're doing here. Um, I also, you know, I you have, to, you have to think about ways to expand. So one of the things that I got fascinated with was what would it really be like to be a hunter? I mean, what would it be like emotionally on you? How would you think? Just like if, you know, you're writing a cop, how does a cop think? A um, friend of mine who was in the service was, said that he was talking to another guy who was in the service. He, he said, do you still do the this when you walk? And I said, and, and you know, I was like, what's that? He goes, that's how they teach you to do when you're walking around. You look, look left, you look up to see if there's a sniper, you look right. And they still do that, you know, when they're just out and about in life. And I was like, I want to I want to get the version of that that hunters would do uh, to just make it feel more real. And then I also got lucky because the first you know, novel, I mean, a plot that I pitched to Titan, I decided I wanted to do a flashback, like a parallel adventure that thematically echoed the current day one, when the, the boys were boys, and they let me do it. I was able to do that for all three of mine at Titan. So what was nice about that is I could sidestep the fact that these guys are such pros, that they should easily be able to handle a problem. I've got them new and learning, and they can grow in a way that maybe the, uh, the current, current ones can't quite grow. Um, I also did my best to ignore the fact that Castiel existed because, uh, like one of my friends mentioned to me, it's like, if you have him, it's like being friends with Superman, you mm -hmm. know, like Jimmy Olsen would just do his watch and Superman would show up and fix everything. Um, and you also have to, it's hard to come up with plots too, when they're so, so skilled, especially after 50 
15 years. I mean, these guys have a lot of experience. You know, you, they go up against one vampire and it's not really going to be a threat to them. But you also can't have them doing like world shaking stuff because it's supposed to be like a monster of the week story kind of. So, you know, you work, at least I would work on trying to find a balance of those things. And yet, ironically, one vampire was all it took. As we yep. <laughs> yep. When I saw that, I was like, really? Seriously? I it's, 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 get away with that in one of my books. It's like Spike said in, in Buffy, all you need is one good day. Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, it, it's to me, it was it was like uh, for that, it was like the guy who lives through multiple tours of duty in a war zone comes home and gets hit by a drunk driver. Yes. You know, happens all the time. Yep. But doesn't always make for a good story, but it happens. Yeah. Yeah. John, how about you? Uh, it's kind of like what Tim said. I, I'm usually putting it between two episodes. So I look at how that first episode ended and where the next one begins and see if there is any kind of emotional valley to explore there. And sometimes there's not much you can do. The emotional arc, uh, the plot arc and the continuity, you can't change it. You can't take them past that next episode where they are emotionally and interacting with each other. So sometimes I will show similar arcs with the, like the third party characters in my book that only exist in my book. So they're going through a similar thing and maybe that aspect of it goes farther than it has with the boys. So try to show a little parallel there too. But uh, the monster of the week approach is basically what I've done for all of my tie-ins because you, they're kind of like pulled out of the continuity. It's like, okay, and then this also happened while this stuff wasn't going on. So that helps to put a story in place that doesn't affect the other things going on that are through that, the whole arc of the show or of the season. You can kind of just put one in there, kind of going back to the X-File days. You have the, I think it started out where everybody liked the conspiracy stuff, but then the conspiracy got so overloaded. You look forward to the Monster of the Week episodes as kind of a, 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 a palate cleanser, so to speak. So that's how I look at these books, you know, a chance to just, Okay, let's just have a story set aside and we don't need to worry about all this other stuff because we can't change it anyway. As tie-in authors, we can't change the continuity. We can't lop off a finger of Sam Rudin or nothing. So you have to work within those constraints. Quick follow-up on that Monster of the Week before we go to Keith. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan of the Monster of the Week episodes because that's one of the things I fell in love with on the show to begin with. But often there is a mirror or a parallel or something we're seeing in that monster of the week episode that harkens back to whatever the friction is between the boys or whatever kind of problem they have to solve was that something you tried to fold into yours as well or did you um not worry about that since you're kind of extracurricular i tried to work it in where i could or look for if i was looking for a particular monster of the week i would try to look for something that kind of reflected what was going on in their lives so it, it was an opportunity I looked for in various books. So. Okay, Keith. Uh, again, like same same approach. Uh, finding finding two episodes um, and and plunking the the novel between them. Um, in each case of the three I did, I tried to at least have something from the overall theme of the season that worked into it. Um, with with Nevermore, it was um, the fact that they were on the run at that point. Um, that was when the FBI was chasing after them. And I actually worked in a completely gratuitous Victor Henriksen cameo for the express purpose of writing Victor Henriksen for a scene just because I wanted to do that because he's like my favorite supernatural guest character. Um, in Bone Key, uh, that, that, whole, that was the third season. And the whole season was about all the demons that had been let loose onto the world. So I just picked two of them because they didn't cover all of them in the season anyway and had them doing something. Um, but I also, I also made use of... Uh, the fact that Dean had made a deal with a crossroads demon in that scene as well, that he was basically giving up his life, which actually gave him an out in the storyline because the the demons were the actual bad guys in, in Bone Key. It was this um, the spirit, the collective spirit of the Calusa people who were going to basically kill off all the non-indigenous people in Key West. And they didn't take Dean because his life was already spoken for because of the deal he made with the Crossroads team, which actually left him free to fight against the thing because the, um, the, the, the his sacrifice would have no power was the exact way I phrase it. And that, that made use of what was already going on in the season, which tied it into that, that time frame a little well. And then the for Heart of the Dragon, the present day portions of that, um, 
uh, directly involved the angel demon war that was going on throughout the fifth season. Um, so I just plugged directly into that and, and tied that, you know, since that was an ongoing concern in season five. Um, and that was a good way to use Castiel without him being Superman because he was too busy fighting a war. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, the plot of that and Heart of the Dragon actually took place. And I, I did the same thing Tim did um, and, and did flashbacks. So I did a story involving the Campbell family uh, in 1969 and then John Winchester fighting the same monster 20 years later in 1989 and that same monster coming back and being embroiled in the Angel Demon War in, in 2009. And am I remembering that you, um, your mention of Victor Henriksen ended up being like the f first mention of him because you're chronologically the first. Yeah, uh, it, I mean, it was it, it the book came out after he had already been established, obviously. But in terms of, of the chronology, my, my novel actually took place before he first appeared in, in Night Shifter. So um, so it was it was and I didn't even realize that until somebody on the Supernatural Wiki pointed it out. <laughs> Very cool. with that. Like I said, I love Henriksen. I, I, <laughs> I was really pissed when they killed him off. But... Now you talk about picking the, the juncture at which your book took place. Uh, am I correct in guessing that, you know, there were so many times the boys were on the outs with each other. I'm guessing you worked around those times because writing a book where Sam and Dean aren't speaking to each other in the Impala the whole way would make for a um, bit more challenging narrative. Or did you just... Uh, did you go for it? What do you, how did that factor into your thinking? Did you work around those places or just dive right in? Um, John? Well, I wanna mention that for my first two books, at least I was told not to use any angel demon stuff. I couldn't have Castile if I wanted them, but uh, it doesn't sound like the other guys had that problem. But- uh, It's all the timing, I think. <laughs> yeah, like, no angels demons. I said, okay, no angels demons, it's fine. Castiel at the time was my son's favorite character. So when I finally was able to use him, that was nice. But uh, I'm trying to think, uh, my second one, my second novel, I had soulless Sam. So I had to deal with that. So it's like Sam not as his normal self. So I didn't do as much uh, POV Sam stuff as I would have with these normal Sam because we weren't too sure at the time what was going on in his head. At least as I, I will say that book stuck out to me as capturing soulless Sam very well. Oh, thank you. So you do have to deal with what's going on in the show. I don't think there's been a, I mean, as Keith said, you want to be as current as possible. So you kind of try to find a nice spot to set the book. So if there's a cliffhanger that carries over from episode 10 to 11, of course you can't set it between 10 and 11. But if, if it looks like there's some space in between 12 and 13, and that's pretty close to current, it's like, oh, well, there's a good spot to put it. But you do have to deal with what's going on in the show. And I mentioned earlier, even when I'm checking dialogue, I want to know where they are with each other. Are they upset with each other at the time? Are they getting along well? You know, what is what is each one's issues? You know, with the outside world and between themselves. So you have to deal with that too, and put that into into the story without moving that emotional arc to get beyond where that next episode comes in. So there are, there are times where you have to work with what's going on in the show. Yeah, there are always Winchester issues. Tim, um, for my the the ones I did for Titan. I, I would try to pick times when they were they were doing okay because I could set it between episodes. So unless it was unless it was like a, a larger arc that was going on at that time, in which case then I'd have it in there and maybe they might just sort of agree to disagree as they're working on this problem or it might come up a little bit as they were doing it. Um, one of the the books I did for Inside Edition, actually the two I did, they didn't want it set in a particular time, and I did one, it was a choose your own adventure book, which was great because I got to kill off the boys in all kinds of ways. <laughs> and I just, and they just wanted me to write short stories. They were choose your own adventure. And I'm like, no, this kind of stuff could actually happen to these guys. So I made it all actually happening, you know, and a problem that they solved at the end, but I wasn't allowed to, to reference anything that would set it into a particular episode. And that made it harder because I didn't know, you know, where they were at exactly. Um, you know, are they just starting out? Are they are they veterans at this point? How do they feel about each other? What's the big problem that in general? Um, I had said it when uh, they were trying to close the door to hell that that particular season, because thematically it worked really good with what I was doing. And they were like, no, you can't do that. So that one was kind of like just generic, I guess, Sam and Dean. You know, I just imagined them having these adventures. 
But, you know, otherwise, no, I tried to pick times where th that I felt like in general, they would probably work pretty well together or whatever problems that might be there. Um, I think one of them was when Dean had the mark of Cain. And so it was early in the season for that. So I only had to have it flare up a little bit. It was working toward that. So, yeah, it wasn't a huge issue for me. Okay, Keith? I, I, I was thinking back then, I, they, they were basically on more or less good terms. I think in either Nevermore or Bone Key, there was like, there was something that one of them was keeping from the other, I don't remember. But um, I, I, think, I think Dean was still, had still didn't, hadn't yet told Sam in Nevermore what John's last words to him were. Um, but aside from that, I don't, I don't think there was any major, they were basically on good terms with each other each time. So I lucked out in that regard. <laughs> Yeah, that one was early enough. I think Sam was still on the fence on whether or not he was going to stay hunting or go back as well and not talking about that piece. So there was yeah. still- there was at least a, Yeah, there was at least a possibility that he was just in yeah. it long enough for the latest thing to be over. But, but that, uh, that insecurity lingered like all 15 years. So you were yes. safe on that. Yes. Uh, at least in Dean's mind. <laughs> now, the lore is always such a big part of Supernatural. And at least from what I've been told, the script writers all had to choose lore that actually existed in some sort of uh, mythology or folklore. They couldn't make it up completely from scratch, although there's always editorial license. How did you approach the lore piece for the magic and the, uh, the occult, supernatural, paranormal piece of things? Tim? I just made up whatever I wanted and okay they didn't they didn't really care the, you know the first one I did carved in flesh it was before they had introduced the Stein family so you know I introduced uh, you know Dr. Frankenstein's creations or whatever in there and they let me do it it wasn't a problem later when I did the uh, men of letters bestiary the my entry on the the uh the Steins, I tried to kind of connect, <laughs> connect those things a little bit. Connected in the Prometheus too. I said that they stole nice. like some of his blood and that's how they got their, the start on their science. Um, and then for Mythmaker, I, my idea was where did the gods come from? And so I actually had them, like a new Mythmaker was born, a human that generated a whole bunch of gods. And then they all fought to see which one was going to stay. It was like Highlander at that point. <laughs> You're going to have one, <laughs> one god that will stay a permanent god. And then when I did um, Children of Anubis, they just let me make up the, the jackal, uh, sh sh they call them the jackal with two Ks, but they were just were jackals instead of werewolves. And they were perfectly happy to let me make it up. So I, was, I, didn't, I didn't have to worry about the lore so much. Okay, so apparently that is an urban myth, of, uh, an urban legend about the writing of Supernatural. Well, somehow. the script writers may have been told that. Yeah, that's possible. Mm -hmm. um, John? I had heard that it had to be something you could Google and get a result mm -hmm. for. That's what so, I had heard too. Yeah. So my approach has always been to find something that you could Google and then read about it from multiple sources. And sometimes there, there are details in one source that aren't in another source mm -hmm. and try to get a feel for what this thing might have been. It's like different people saw different aspects of it, but maybe not nobody saw the entire package. So that gave me some freedom to add things to, to the lure that was Googleable, but also tied into what uh, I needed to do in the story. So like the night hag, uh, I had the night hag's uh, nightmares coming to life, being actualized and uh, the Oni from the second book, I took to being kind of like the opposite of, uh, well, the not the opposite, but an extension of Murphy's law, like whatever can go wrong will go wrong and take that to extremes. So it's kind of like building on the lore. Like we don't know everything. Maybe we know 50% of what this thing is and what it can do. And then there's another 50% that is subject to interpretation. So it's just part of the invention and creation process to take that start that starting kit and then add on other features to it. Okay, Keith? I was never given any instructions in that regard, but I didn't need to be because I always love to take existing folklore and mess with it. So um, that, that, that was already what I was already going to do that anyhow. Um, although one of the things I wanted to do in particular in Nevermore was a piece of lore that was wrong. Um, I specifically wanted, because we always see guys who are doing these occult rituals that will bring forth a demon or bring forth a ghost or do this. I wanted one that actually turned out to be complete nonsense. That, and so this guy found this ritual that it turns out was complete hokum. 
but he was doing it anyway because he believed that it would actually work. In this case, it would resurrect uh, Edgar Allan Poe um, by committing a series of ritual things, murders, basically. Um, but it wouldn't actually work. And it's in like the, the back of John's journal on fake stuff. <laughs> um, because there would be, there would be people who would come up with, with you know, grifters and, and, and snake oil magicians, basically, who would, who would come up with rituals that wouldn't actually do anything. But, that, but the guy's still going out and killing people in the name of this ritual, so Sam and Dean still have to stop him. Um, and I also did stuff with you know, what the show was already doing with angels and with demons and with ghosts in particular. Um, and in Bone Key, I, I made use of the Kalusa, like I said, the Kalusa, who were uh, an indigenous uh, people who, uh, they were from the Florida Keys, and they refused to trade with the, the Europeans who came in and were then wiped out by the other people who did trade with the Europeans and got cool things like duns. So, um, so they were wiped out. Um, and I made use of that, that particular bit of history. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Key West. I love Key West um, and, and Key West lore. And, and I thought it was a great place to put a supernatural novel, um, which was actually, which is one of the fun things about doing, and this is shooting off on a tangent from what you were asking, but one of the cool things that we can do in supernatural fiction is do things the show can't. Um, because in the show, they drive all over the country, but everywhere they go looks just like Vancouver. Um, we don't have that constraint when we're writing. So when the, the, the big thing that tie-in fiction can do that the show can't is embrace the location, which is why I very deliberately set my three novels in New York City, in Key West, and in San Francisco, which are all municipalities that have very distinctive characters that the show really wasn't able to recreate. Um, you know, I mean, they could probably recreate Seattle, but that's about it. <laughs> and, um, so that, that, that was a big part of what I wanted to do in my three books, at least. And I know Jeff, Jeff did that with Witches Canyon too. Yeah. Now, one of the things that um, Kim Manners always said that he wanted to do and, and didn't get a chance to, although we do get glimpses on and off throughout the series, is seeing the boys between big hunts. You know, we, we got that one glimpse of them doing laundry when they're reading the Carver Edlin books, reading about themselves doing laundry. Uh, but surely there were a lot of those moments in between the big hunts that would have been very mundane. And because we see them so little, very precious to kind of get that insight. Did you write any of those moments in as segues or did you kind of stick to just going from the big scene to the big scene? John? Well, the one that pops out in my head is having Dean washing baby in, in, the, in the garage. Uh, and. Uh, that was kind of a, I think I started the process of having the first chapter with them be them wrapping up a hunt before they start on the next one. So kind of jump into the action. And with that one, I didn't do that specifically, you know, from notes. So I had to come up with something else. And I just had a chance of, of, to have Dean like giving extra care to baby during that scene where he's upset about something. He's always upset about something, but that's, that's okay. Sticks out. Tim. Yeah, I did my first two for Titan. I had it had them end with like a previous adventure, you know, a hunt. And then when I uh, had my outline for the third one, they're like, you know, we do this a lot. Have a, have them doing nothing. So I said <laughs> the man. <beginning. laughs> so for Children of Anubis, after the hunt was over, um, Dean, like you know, he Googled like what restaurants and stuff are nearby, and they were half an hour away from House of a Thousand Pies, and he was determined. It was like a mecca for him. He was determined that they had to go there. Um, you know, in another book, I did have them. You know, they had to wait a little bit for something to happen, and so they were just hanging out in a donut shop. Uh, when I did the flashbacks to when they were kids, I wanted to show what it was like. You know, when John was gone and they're stuck in the hotel room. Um, and so I showed some of that before the kids got involved in their own kind of, you know, side adventure for that, for that book. Um, so yeah, I did do some of that. Okay. Keith? I love doing that. That was, that was, that was part of the fun of doing the books is you have the storytelling space to do stuff like that. Um, in Heart of the Dragon, I actually had Dean at a, at a high stakes poker game, um, thus addressing my constant annoyance with the show, which is how the hell they managed to feed, clothe, and house themselves. Um, and it was, it was a very high stakes poker game, like basically, and, and, and I had Dean, because I'm also a poker player, and, and I loved writing Dean, you know, basically in the game um, as, it's, as it's going, and it's down to him and this last guy 
uh, the last two people standing at the table and Dean winning his final hand. And um, that was fun. And, um, and in Bone Key, I wrote what is still probably my favorite bit that I've done in, in my three Supernatural books. I, I deliberately had it take place shortly after a very supernatural Christmas in the third season so I could have Sam, Dean, and Bobby in Bobby's house on New Year's Eve watching the ball drop and having Dean bitching about how Ryan Seacrest was not worthy to succeed Dick Clark. (laughs) Because Dick Clark posted American Bandstand, all Ryan Seacrest has ever done is admit he's not gay. And to Dean's mind, that is not, you know, all he did was host some lame Star Search wannabe show and, and, and that is not, that is, he is not fit to shine Dick Clark's shoes. So there, Uh, that was fun. Little things. Folks, believe it or not, we have already gone through the time. You've been Ah. wondering, this has been so much fun. So I'd like to go around again, let everybody know if you've got something new or recent or upcoming and where to find you on social media. Keith? Uh, You can find me online at decandido.net, which is a terrible website, but it links to all the places where I, uh, where I hang out uh, online. So it's a, it's a handy guide to cyber stalking me. Uh, my most recent books, uh, I've got an urban fantasy series out. Uh, the first book is called The Furnace Sealed. I'm working on book two, which is about a supernatural puncher for hire in New York City. So if you like supernatural, you'll probably like that. Um, and I've got a new novella out uh, called All the Way House, which is part of the Systema Paradoxa series about cryptids. Uh, it's about the Jersey Devil and the secret origin of that. And again, you can find me at, at decandido.net and that, that guy that leads you to all the places where I am online, including my Patreon and my YouTube channel and my blog and all that good stuff. Tim, uh, John. Uh, well, most of my information is at pastorello.com. Uh, I'm one of those authors who has had a problem during the pandemic of not being able to write consistently. Consistently, I'm working on a fourth Wither novel, a Wendy Ward novel, and I've got three or four other projects. I'm just having trouble getting momentum. Uh, I've been vaccinated now, so I'm hoping that that anxiety will decrease. I've had an essential worker part-time job the whole time, so I think that's messed with my head a bunch. But my most recent novel out was the Halloween movie novelization, which came out around the same time as my last Supernatural book, uh, Joyride. So that's, uh, I'm also on Facebook. I'm on Twitter, not as much as I used to be, but I'm on Facebook. Okay, great. Okay. Tim? Well, you can find me at timwagner.com and, you know, it links to all the places. You know, it's the, the central central way to find me. Um, last book I had come out was a horror novel called Your Turn to Suffer. Before that, it was my how to write horror book, Writing in the Dark. And I'm just chugging away, working on more novels right now. Got more stuff coming out in the next year, too. But find all about it at my website. Awesome. Writing in the Dark is a brilliant title for a how to write horror book. That is well done. (laughs) And I'm pretty easy to find as well. Of course, as Gail, I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, near future post-apocalyptic novels and more. As Morgan, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance, but all the modern worlds are ones where Sam and Dean could walk in and feel right at home. Uh, I haven't written Supernatural tie-in, but I did write a chapter in There'll Be Peace When You Are Done, which was the collection on the legacy of Supernatural by Lynn Supernus. And I run the Supernatural TFWNC fan group here on Facebook when I'm not here on Continual. Uh, all of my social media presence and websites are based on my name. So if you spell them right, you've got me. And of course, I'm here on Continual. So thank you all very, very much for taking the time to be with us today. And thank all of you for watching and listening. There'll be more Supernatural coming up here in Continual, so I'll see you online.